75 die in Las Vegas hotel fire. Police start internal inquiry on ripper killing. Government puts new curbs on cigarette advertising. A new deal for out of work youngsters. The diamond that's a man's best friend. Good evening. 75 people have died in a flash fire in the huge MGM Grand Hotel in Las Vegas. A spokesman for the local fire department said the figure could reach as high as 100. Flames and choking smoke poured through the casino hotel, which with over 2,000 rooms and 26 stories, is one of the biggest in the world. Most of the dead were found in their rooms, suffocated in their sleep or unable to get out because of the clouds of smoke. Survivors said there was no alarm given, but more than a thousand guests managed to reach the roof and were lifted to safety by helicopter. Norman Rees reports. With hundreds of guests trapped on the upper floors of the 26-story hotel, a dozen helicopters were called in to help pluck people from the blazing building. Officials think the fire started in a basement kitchen. Within minutes, it had engulfed the ground floor casino that covers an area as big as a football field. Most of the injured were cut by glass as they ran through plate glass doors or broke windows trying to escape the smoke. Others were overcome by the fumes. Firemen's ladders could reach only the 10th floor. Guests who made their way to the roof were winched slowly and painfully to safety by the helicopter rescue team. Many of the survivors complained they knew nothing of the fire until smoke began pouring into their rooms. They say there was no alarm. Flames that destroyed the stairways, and they had no alternative but to make their way to balconies or the roof, waiting either for a helicopter or firemen to lead them to safety. At least 2,000 people are believed to have been in the hotel at the time of the blaze, and firemen say they may find still more bodies as their room-by-room -room search of the building continues. Britain's firemen are to come out on a series of one-day national strikes. They won't even answer 999 calls. The firemen say they'll give 24 hours notice of the first strike after that, there'll be no warning. But the men's union say there won't be a strike until they've had another meeting with the employers to see if there's any improvement on the 6% pay offer. The decision to call the one-day strikes was taken at a special conference in Blackpool. Alistair Stewart was there today when they took it. The fireman's executive who'd drawn up the battle plan had the job of selling it to 300 delegates from brigades throughout the country. But evidently it didn't require too strong a sales pitch. The men feel they've been cheated of what they see as theirs by rights under a two-year-old deal which ended the last fireman's strike. And after just an hour and a half of debate, the conference was unanimous. It called for a series of one-day national strikes. And even with 24 hours' notice, the army and their green goddesses are going to find it hard to meet the challenge. With no notice for future strikes, it's a daunting prospect. So why had the firemen decided on this apparently extreme action? The decision shows the anger of firemen and is a clear message from firemen to the local authority employers and to the government of how they feel over the dis dishonouring of this pay agreement. And the reason that we are so adamant that this pay formula must be kept is to stop us every year getting pushed into this industrial arena where it becomes an argument about cash limits and us being caught up in that type of argument. We don't want to withdraw our labour, but it looks as if we'll have no alternative, unless the employers between now and the setting of the date for the first one-day stoppage are prepared to meet us, and that's what we want. And the firemen are making good use of the letter Home Secretary William Whitelaw wrote two years ago, in which he said, as opposition spokesman, the firemen's pay formula would be honoured. They clearly hope to embarrass the government into coming up with the cash to pay their 18.8% pay rise and a series of vital meetings are planned with that end in mind. There's to be intense activity next week with the firemen's executive meeting on Tuesday, the county council employers on Wednesday and the joint national negotiators on Thursday. But it seems clear after today's conference that if the firemen don't get their full 18.8%, there will be a one-day national strike. Alistair Stewart, News at 10, Blackpool. A soldier related to the murdered London schoolboy, Stephen Edmonston, has been charged with conspiring to murder the man accused of killing him. The soldier, Neville Edmonston, who's 19, 
and a cousin of Stephen was arrested on Wednesday, the day before the boy's funeral. Two other soldiers are charged with him of conspiring to kill Bernard McAnaspey, Stephen's next door neighbour in Essex, and the man charged with killing him. It was here behind Walthamstow bus station in a car park that the three soldiers were arrested in civilian clothes the day before Stephen's funeral. Before the arrest, it appears police had not been especially watching the soldiers' movements. They were detained in a new Ford Cortina by detectives specifically looking on Wednesday for car thieves. The weapons taken away were two Sterling submachine guns, live ammunition, a smoke grenade, CS canister and several thunder flashes. The three soldiers belong to the 2nd Battalion Royal Green Jackets based at Tidworth in Hampshire. Edmonston, a 19-year-old private, was on compassionate leave to attend his cousin's funeral. Corporal Ivor Hurst, who's 25, and Private Gary Rosier, who's 21, were both on two weeks' leave before posting to Germany. Tonight, the three are held at Chingford Police Station. Bernard McAnaspey, meanwhile, the dustman accused of Stephen's murder, and who, it's alleged, the three soldiers conspired to murder, is held elsewhere. The funeral for nine-year-old Stephen yesterday had brought Harlow to a standstill. The floral tributes reflected his passion for football. His body was found at the end of October, four miles from his home in Harlow. It was in a ditch on the road leading to a local caravan site and beauty spot. The discovery at Royden Mill followed a major police hunt. Stephen had been missing for two days. He'd been stabbed, sexually assaulted and beaten. Nick Gowing, News at 10 in East London. About 50 car workers smashed windows at Leyland's Longbridge plant at Birmingham today, protesting about being laid off in a dispute over Minimetro seats. Leyland were having some seats made outside the plant and these were blacked. John McLeod of ATV reports. In the angry We Want to Work protest, office windows and apparently a few car windscreens were smashed and at least one building forcibly occupied. BL discount reports of damaged cars and frightened management forced to hide. The men are frustrated at yet another layoff without pay just weeks before Christmas. They were ordered home when other workers blacked Metro seats made by an outside firm, but they simply refused to go. We want to work. We wouldn't have come in this morning, would we? You know, we want to work. We've got to work. If you could work, what could you do then? We could do the jobs. Rectifying, fitting seats, Same anything that they now, want us to do. We yeah. just said another run, well, not a run or anything, but we just said we want to work. <laughs> but what good is it doing to you being on this gate here? Well, we, might, we might as well be here. Yeah. We it's really? a form of protest. We're getting it's nothing here and we're getting nothing at home. That's what it looks like. Oh, BL say the seats at the centre of the rail were only brought in to clear a backlog of several thousand metros. And until that row is settled, the men stay laid off. John McLeod for News at 10 at Longbridge in Birmingham. Police hunting the Yorkshire Ripper are holding an internal inquiry into claims that they lost 12 hours before following up a vital piece of evidence. Students living in the area where Jacqueline Hill's body was found are demanding better security. Ken Reese reports from Leeds on the growing row over the way police handled the discovery of Jacqueline's handbag. Police had arrived at the murder scene just a few hours after the killing. A student had earlier found the blood-stained handbag on the pavement, just 30 yards or so from the body itself, which wasn't discovered till the next day. The handbag was marked with the name Jackie Hills, and back at the university flats, students became worried. Well, as soon as we saw there was blood on the outside of the bag, we phoned the police on a 999 call. Um, we were concerned that a student was possibly injured somewhere. Um, Did you offer to help them to find the owner of the bank? Yes, we offered to call out the full-time site agent who has access to a list of names of all the students on this site. Um, but the police didn't seem to consider it necessary. Today, at a special press conference, the Chief Constable of West Yorkshire, Mr Ronald Gregory, answered criticisms of the way his men had handled the affair that night and the lack of a full search. Property is found every day with blood stains on it, and, and, and with hindsight, you could say, well, as soon as something with blood stains is found on it, you, they, they should have a very careful search of the area. There might be a body. If you find a woman's handbag lying in the street, with the property still contained in it, it's got blood stains on it. Surely, the first thing anybody's going to think of is that there's been some kind of violence or violent attack on somebody. It's reasonable to assume that, yes. So, what was done on that assumption? Certainly, that, that, that could be a reasonable assumption, yes. Are you satisfied that enough action was taken then 
after the finding of this. At the moment, it is being investigated and the officers are being asked for an explanation. Meanwhile, in Halifax, Mrs. Olive Smelt, who was badly hurt in a previous Ripper attack but who survived, says she's been having threatening calls from a man called Jack, and she's now very frightened. Always have the fear he could come back for us. Could possibly think he hadn't finished his job right. It's always there in the back of your mind. Ken Rees, News at 10, West Yorkshire. The two Bradford sisters, jailed for the manslaughter of their father, have been refused bail, but Annette and Charlene Moore have been granted leave to appeal and it will be heard within 10 days. Lord Justice Ackner said he'd refused bail because he didn't want to preempt the decision of the Court of Appeal. He said the judge who'd given the girls a three-year sentence had clearly viewed the manslaughter in a significantly different light from that in which it had been portrayed by the media. The Department of Health has announced new curbs on tobacco advertising. They include stronger health warnings on cigarette packets, a ban on cigarette posters near schools, and X certificates for cigarette advertising in cinemas. The measures cover the next 20 months, but the Labour Party today described the moves as feeble, and the anti-smoking group Ash said it's like the Home Guard trying to fight off a nuclear attack. Our Home Affairs correspondent, Glyn Mathias, reports. Under the agreement, tobacco companies will have to cut £6 million from their poster advertisements for cigarettes next year. The posters won't be allowed at all at sites near schools or playgrounds. It's one of several measures designed to control the growing scale of tobacco advertising. Cigarette adverts in cinemas will have to carry an X certificate in the future. For their part, the companies say they will introduce more low-tar brands and there'll be no new high-tar brands in the future. Above all, there'll be stronger and more varied health warnings on packets and on advertisements. On hoardings like this one, the warnings will become more prominent and be given more space. The agreement isn't as strong as the government would have liked. It doesn't reduce newspaper advertisements and doesn't cover sports sponsorship. Anti-smoking campaigners said it wouldn't cut cigarette sales at all. Health Minister Sir George Young. It'll cut the promotion of cigarettes. In the final analysis, it's up to smokers to decide whether they heed the health warning and the other advice that we give them. Um, consumption of cigarettes is a personal matter. All the government can do is try and create a framework where smoking is not the norm and where the risks of smoking get through to people, particularly young children who haven't yet started smoking. And that's what we're trying to do with this agreement. Of course, we welcome any step forward. There's no steps backward here. But this doesn't begin to deal with things like, for example, television uh, coverage of sponsored events of sport or the arts and all sorts of other ways the tobacco industry has found of circumventing uh, the voluntary agreement. Uh, really, we're very far away from that, and there's no question we've got to have legislation. There is now a real threat of legislation hanging over the tobacco companies. The medical profession want it, the Labour Party want it, and there is now possibly a majority of MPs who, on a free vote, would be in favour of restricting tobacco advertising by law. So a lot now depends on the extent to which this renewed voluntary agreement really does cut back on encouraging people to smoke. Glyn Mathias, News at 10, Westminster. British pilot Judith Chisholm is close to beating the record for flying a single-engine plane from England to Australia, but may not be able to halve it as she'd hoped. She left Jakarta in Indonesia after a seven-hour delay to find and connect more oxygen needed for high-altitude flying. Her destination is Port Hedland near Perth in Western Australia. She's still in good spirits despite only four hours sleep since Tuesday. Mr Pryor, the Employment Secretary, announces a new deal for out-of-work teenagers. We'll have a report in part two. A leading member of EXIT, the Voluntary Euthanasia Society, is to be prosecuted for aiding and abetting people to commit suicide. Britain says she'll take 90 boat people nobody else wants. And the diamond that belonged to Napoleon's brother in a couple of minutes. A £250 million new deal for the young unemployed has been announced by the government. The Employment Secretary, Mr Pryor, said it was a massive practical demonstration of the government's concern, but the opposition said it fell far short of what was needed. Under the scheme, all out-of-work school leavers will get job training until their 18th birthday. There will be an extra 180,000 places in the Youth Opportunities Programme, and training is to start earlier, by Christmas rather than at Easter. For adults, the special temporary employment programme is to be scrapped and replaced with what's called a community enterprise programme for 25,000 people. The government think that'll provide more useful work for the unemployed than the present system. 
Giles Smith asked Mr Pryor, weren't the new messes just designed to keep people off the dole for a short time? Yes, of course, you're right. And we all recognise this, that in the long run we've got to provide uh, economic activity which provides real jobs. And that is the government's aim. What I think these measures do is to show that the government is deeply concerned, particularly about certain categories, and is doing all it can, it can to help in very difficult circumstances. These are the kind of projects Mr Pryor hopes to promote. Training workshops, where youngsters learn such skills as engineering on the one hand, and office procedure on the other. They're taught how to cope with a permanent job, should they be lucky enough to get one. The trainees are paid £23.50 a week, more than they get on the dole, but not enough to make them wildly enthusiastic about the scheme. So far as this training workshop's concerned, Today's £250 million is a useful gesture, but little more. Well, I suppose the optimist would say every little helps and half a loaf is better than no loaf at all. My attitude is it's no point having half a loaf if it's still, it doesn't do the system any good. Uh, therefore, I would take the view that it's too little too late. The government says every unemployed school leaver will now have the opportunity for job training. But whether they find work after their training is another matter entirely. At this centre, only three trainees out of 36 have found permanent jobs. John Underwood, News at 10, in North London. ITN's job survey shows that another 10,000 people lost their jobs this week, and the Ministry of Defence disclosed that they've shed over 4,500 jobs in the past six months, though there have been no compulsory redundancies. The 1,600 workers at Bowater Paper Mill in Ellesmere Port on Merseyside went to work there for the last time today. Bowater decided several weeks ago that they couldn't afford to keep the factory open because energy costs are just too high. The British paper industry has been severely hit by the recession and 14 mills have shut down this year. Another thousand papermaking jobs have gone this week. 770 at Dickinson Robinson's Croxley Mill near Watford and 200 at the East Lanks Mill and Transparent Paper near Bury. Talbot UK is sacking 1,600 at Coventry, Dunstable and Luton, and car component makers AC Delco are getting rid of 470 at Liverpool and Dunstable. The Burton Group are making up to 1,400 redundancies at five sites in Yorkshire. More job losses in Wales. Clanethley-based civil engineers Tyson are cutting back by 700. 560 jobs are going at the Alcoa Aluminium plant in Swansea, and about 200 at Brig Ray Textiles at four plants in South Wales. Jobs are going in Scotland as well, 350 at the Linden Bakery in Glasgow and the same number at Burroughs Office Machinery in Cumbernauld. Other job losses include 260 at Samuel Williams, the Dagenham Shippers, 230 at Dunlop Polymer in Leicester and 230 at Grundy Engineering Factories in West London and Staffordshire. This week's new jobs include 500 at the Basingstoke Shopping Centre, 280 at International Superstores in Kent and East London, 250 at British Vigo Medical Equipment in Swindon, and 200 at the Inland Revenue's PAYE office in Telford. A leading member of the Voluntary Euthanasia Society, known as Exit, is to be prosecuted for aiding and abetting people to commit suicide. Mr Nicholas Reed, Exit's General Secretary, faces a total of six charges. They follow police investigation of 12 suicides and attempted suicides in various parts of Britain. John's a month ago, 750 people packed into a hall in London to debate the issue of euthanasia. They were members of EXIT, the British Society for the Right to Die with Dignity. It was the culmination of a campaign by EXIT to provide those, particularly the terminally ill, with the chance to choose the moment of their death. At the meeting, EXIT's members voted to go ahead and publish a booklet that offers advice to individuals on how to bring their lives to an end gently and with dignity. The vote was carried despite the fear that the booklet might contravene the 1961 Suicide Act. Behind the scenes, EXIT had meanwhile continued with its advice work on euthanasia. The scale of Exit's publicity was such that the authorities could not easily sidestep the issue. Tonight, Mr Nicholas Reed, Exit's General Secretary, was summoned to a North London police station and charged with six offences of aiding and abetting or procuring people to commit suicide. 
his reaction? I think if any good is going to come out of these trials, it may be some clarification in the law, but I do find it highly ironic that if I had been working in Scotland, I don't believe any charges could or would have been made against me. One hopes that the law will be administered in a reasonably compassionate way, but it does seem quite clear that the DPP, the Director of Public Prosecutions at the moment, is determined to try to uphold the law as it is, however ridiculous it may be. A government think tank report says the National Health Service is inefficient, bureaucratic and expensive. The Centre for Policy Studies says patients suffer intolerable waits for treatment and doctors are harassed and overworked. But the National Association of Health Authorities in England and Wales has rejected the charges. It said the NHS had a record of achievement to be proud of. Dr David Owen has decided he won't stand for the Labour Party's new shadow cabinet. Dr Owen, who's been opposition energy spokesman, says he wants the freedom to challenge party policy from the back benches. In a letter to his Plymouth constituency, he talks of his profound differences over decisions of the Black Folk Conference, especially on defence and the common market. Mr Jerzy Orzdowski, a 55-year-old economics professor, is the first Catholic to hold one of Poland's five deputy premierships. He was unanimously elected by the Polish Parliament. In China, Wang Hongwen, the youngest member of the so-called Gang of Four, is reported to have admitted charges of plotting to overthrow Chairman Mao Zedong. The report in the official Chinese newspaper, The People's Daily, adds that the other three, headed by Mao's widow, have also partly confessed. At least 20 people have been killed and more than 100 injured in a train crash near Vibo Valentia in southern Italy. Rescue workers have been working for hours to free people from the wreckage. The accident happened after a southbound express crashed into a line of 28 freight cars that had somehow become uncoupled from a local train. The impact threw them across the track into the path of a northbound express train which was travelling at 70 miles an hour, 75 miles an hour. Britain has agreed to give refuge to up to 93 Vietnamese boat people who have been stranded in Bangkok for several weeks. They were picked up by the Logos, British owned but registered in Singapore, off the Vietnamese coast six weeks ago. The Singapore government, despite British pressure, refused to take them, giving their final no yesterday. Today, we decided to end their plight and allow them into Britain. The Logos is owned by a British charity, Christian Outreach, and used to distribute religious literature. It came on two boats crammed with Vietnamese refugees at the beginning of October. Originally, the Logos skipper gave them food and tried to repair their engines. Then he took them in tow, but a storm blew up and the boat started to sink. The skipper took the refugees on board and then took them to Bangkok, but no one wanted to help. Britain has taken 12,000 Vietnamese boat people since 1975. The Navy has been showing for the first time its Sea Harrier jump jets taking off from a ramp on the aircraft carrier, the HMS Invincible. The ramp, known as a ski jump, is on the ship's bows and it'll allow the Harrier to carry much heavier loads than before. Our defence correspondent, Geoffrey Archer, was on the Invincible to see the plane taking off. HMS Invincible, the first of three of a new type of compact aircraft carrier for the Royal Navy, has already produced a pleasant surprise for her designers. The ski jump fitted to her bows is so effective in boosting her Harrier jets into the air, the planes can carry a greater payload than expected. The ramp is set at an angle of seven degrees and was always intended to increase the Harrier's payloads. But in practice, it's been found the Harrier can carry 500 pounds more than the most hopeful predictions. Today, Invincible was coming towards the end of her present series of trials aimed at bringing her to full operational readiness next year. But progress in her workup has not been helped by the recent moratorium on defence spending. This naval version of the Harrier seems set for a successful future, but military planners on both sides of the Atlantic are looking for a supersonic development of the plane for future small aircraft carriers. So far, however, the funds for a full-scale development programme have not been made available. With the ski jump proving so unexpectedly effective, the Navy has shown that it is able to re-establish worthwhile air power at sea at a fraction of the cost of a conventional aircraft carrier. And the combination of HMS Invincible and the Harrier and the ski jump could well encourage Britain and America to press ahead now with the development of the next generation of vertical takeoff aircraft. Geoffrey Archer, News at 10, on board HMS Invincible. The main points of the news again. At least 75 people have died in a hotel fire in Las Vegas. 
Britain's farmer is to hold a series of national one-day strikes and won't be answering emergency calls. A soldier related to the murdered Essex schoolboy Stephen Edmonston has been charged with conspiring to murder the man accused of killing the child. Police hunting the Yorkshire Ripper are holding an inquiry into claims that they lost valuable time before following up clues to the Ripper's latest murder. And the Department of Health has announced new restrictions on tobacco advertising, as well as stronger health warnings on cigarette packets. Finally, for the man who has everything, a diamond called the Polar Star, once owned by Napoleon's brother, was sold today in Geneva for the record price of £1,960,784. It weighs over 41 carats, and it's a world record per carat as well as for a single stone. After its Bonaparte period, it belonged to a Russian princess and finally to Lady Detterding, wife of the founder of Royal Dutch Shell, as part of whose collection it's now been sold. The bidding was in Swiss francs. Eight million. That's your last chance. Eight million. A vous, monsieur. That's 600. Its new owner is Mr. Razin Salia of Sri Lanka. He said he'd bought it as an investment. Make a nice Christmas present for someone. That's all from us. Good night.